Bethlehem College and Seminary is still accepting applications for the coming academic year. For more information, visit bcsmn.edu. All right. Well, I'm really excited about uh, this chapel panel. We're doing a number of these, obviously, this, uh, this semester as a part of our focus on the glory of God and the common good. And um, there's lots of different ways that we pursue and seek the common good as Christians. We've talked about some in terms of family. We've talked about some in terms of building a culture of life uh, in our communities through adoption and foster care and so forth. And we've got some more planned for, for later in the semester. But today, uh, I'm pleased to be joined by two friends of mine to talk about the role of kind of politics and the common good, which is a, a broader topic than maybe we're, we think about. Now, there is an election coming up in about a month or so, uh, and so there is that dimension of it, and we'll talk some about that, but there's actually a lot more to it than that, and these two guys uh, are w wonderful resources uh, for me, for us, uh, as we think about that question. So who I have here, um, John Helmberger and Josh Foster both work for the, the Minnesota Family Council. Uh, John's the CEO and has been the CEO for how long? 18 years, CEO. He's a member at Bethlehem's North Campus. Uh, and, you know, I've, I've been here, so 17 years. And so my entire time here in Minnesota, I've known you in that role. We've done, partnered together on various kinds of initiatives. And, uh, you know, you've had me come down to do some stuff with legislators. So I've gotten to know John uh, fairly well over the last 17 years and really grateful for uh, his investment at the Minnesota Family Council. We'll talk more about what you guys do. And then Josh Foster, one of my uh, brother pastors at Cities Church, uh, but also is the outreach coordinator for um, the Church Ambassador Network at Minnesota Family Council, which is a, a subset. It's a particular kind of initiative. And so I want you to get a picture of the different sorts of things that these guys do. So maybe, John, maybe why don't you talk a little bit about Family Council in general and kind of what you guys do uh, on the whole. Minnesota Family Council is a, a Christian citizenship ministry. Our, our mission is to uh, uh, inform and engage Christian citizens to be a winsome biblical voice in our culture and to engage as, you know, with their citizenship, exercising their citizenship in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, as the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians about their citizenship. And perhaps we'll have a chance to say a little bit more about that later. Uh, um, but what, what that in, involves is um, engaging with churches to in, uh, and with their pastors to inform them about issues. I'm going to let Joshua share a little bit more about the Church Ambassador Network. But um, uh, beyond that, engaging with, with uh, pastors and with their churches uh, to inform the citizens in the churches about the issues that relate to the sanctity of human life and of God's good design for family and religious freedom in our state and, and uh, inform them about those issues and engage them in, a, in effective ways to impact policy down at our, our state capital and around our state in, uh, um, in local bodies uh, and uh, to engage them in elections to support like-minded candidates for the ministry of elected office. That's what God calls it, a ministry of, of um, political leadership, and, uh, and, and so we call people to faithfulness in the ministry of elected office and support um, men and women who are like-minded with us on life, family, and religious freedom to, um, to serve and lead uh, in that fashion to help us implement policies that will uphold those principles and, uh, and hold back other policies that conflict with, with those foundational biblical values. Um, and, uh, and more recently, we have uh, launched a legal arm because increasingly we're seeing that it's not enough to merely pass good laws and stop bad laws. Increasingly, we're seeing good laws being challenged in court and, and bad laws being advanced through the courts. And so um, we have launched a legal arm so that we can engage effectively at that level to fight for life, liberty, or uh, life, family, and religious freedom uh, in the legal channel as well. Great. So, Josh, uh, you've, you work in the Church Ambassador Network. So maybe talk a little bit about the distinctive thing that you guys do there. Yeah. Um, so Church Ambassador Network, basically, we, uh, we take the shepherds of the church and connect them with the shepherds of the government. Um, and the, the main thing that we try to do is uh, we take 1 Timothy 2 seriously where it says um, pray for all people, then uh, 
Paul specifically says, for kings and all in high positions. And um, in our form of government, we don't have kings, but we've taken the king and we've broken him up into little pieces. And, you know, we have legislators, we have um, representatives, senators. And so we, uh, we basically, we go to them, both sides of the aisle, uh, uh, as pastors, and uh, we try to sow the word. Um, in their life, but we also try to honor them as um, not only as image bearers of God, but also as um, representatives. They chose to to represent um, their, you know, the people in their um, district or ward, and uh, and we ask them how can we be praying for them. And so um, we a lot of times they're used to uh, people coming and lobbying for all sorts of different things, and uh, for us we it, it takes a little bit of time sometimes, but we. We honestly say we're not here to to uh, lobby necessarily like a certain position. This we're like we're here to honor you and uh, uh, give you uh, thanks and to pray for you while also encouraging you from the word and try to uh, just uh, have that relationship and build that relationship. So, yeah. So I want you to hear just two things in just that that difference there is on the one hand, uh, MFC really does do the kind of um, election focus, uh, some lobbying. Uh, some religious liberty, so on the policy and on the legal side and that sort of stuff. So that's, that's a part of it, um, which is important because those policies do matter and, and, and it's important to engage at the election level. But then this other side, which is more, hey, these, these, are, um, these elected representatives are um, deacons of God, as, as uh, Paul says in Romans, and uh, they're eternal souls and they need to be cared for. And so, which is often, as Josh said, so I've gone a couple of times uh, with uh, some of Josh's colleagues to uh, meet with uh, my representative and then just others around the state. We just kind of walked down, <laughs> down the offices and just saw who was home. And it was like, hey, can we come in and we talk? And they would say, well, sure. And, uh, and sit down and talk. What's on your, what's heavy right now? Right? And it's, it's an amazing thing. And I'd, I'd love to maybe hear if you've got, you know, any, any kind of anecdotes or things you want to share about kind of the, the opportunities for gospel ministry. You're a pastor uh, at our church, but then you're also kind of, like you said, shepherding the shepherds of the yeah. state. And so um, there was, so one anecdote on, on my side was we sat down, we're talking to this um, Democratic senator from uh, outstate and uh, just kind of said, hey, what's, what's hard, what's heavy for you right now? And she almost you know, falls to tears about just the opi opioid issues in her community. Just the, the, and she's just like, I don't, I don't know what to do. And so she's just feeling the weight of her community and seeing the way that, that drugs are ravaging some of the stuff up in the Iron Range. And she's going, and I'm here and I wanna help. She's a Christian. Uh, so I mean, it's, just, it's this weird, you know, odd sort of deal. We don't normally think it was a Democratic senator, but she's a, a believer in an evangelical church. Her pastor comes to our pastor's conference actually. Uh, and so I knew her pastor, we were able to connect over that, but then to just say, okay, well, um, that's the heavy thing. What's the impossible thing in your mind right now? And so she's talking about, it. well, let's pray about that. Mm. And, uh, and it's just a way of encouraging. So it was a really sweet time for me as a pastor to encourage her, mm -hmm. but also, um, I think a really meaningful time for her to feel like there's people here who are not just after something from me, mm -hmm. but really want to help me. So any, any other kind yeah. of things you've got? I kinda? think, um, I mean, one of the big takeaways we get, uh, a big part is, uh, we're, they think we're gonna ask them for something specific and we, we're asking them for prayer and how they're doing and they, they are not used to that at all. Um, and so we're, a lot of times we're trying to bring pastors from their um, district as well. And I think another uh, b like shared burden is um, as pastors, uh, we get what it's like um, sometimes having to make hard decisions or just not like you're not gonna please everyone. Everyone has so many different expectations of leaders and, um, and politicians feel that in a, in a unique way where, you know, you're getting pulled in so many different directions. And, um, and so I think there's like a, a shared uh, type of um, burden that uh, we can uh, sympathize with. And, uh, and I think they, they appreciate that. And so. Um, so let me shift over here back to the We'll come back to some of that too. Uh, on the political side, big moment here in American politics because in June, uh, the Supreme Court overturned one of the worst decisions in American history, Roe v. Wade, uh, in the Dobbs decision, which essentially threw the, the, the uh, abortion question back to the states. 
And, uh, and so that means it doesn't mean abortion's illegal everywhere. Uh, it means now the states, it's back in the, elect, uh, the, the democratic processes for us to vote. So maybe you wanna speak a little bit about what did that do in Minnesota? What was the effect of the Dobbs decision on uh, the legal protections for unborn children in the state of Minnesota? Yes, um, in, in some states, a number of states, uh, there were what were called trigger laws in place. These were laws regulating abortions that had been on their books, or limiting abortion, that had been on their books prior to the Roe v. Wade decision, which was handed down in 1973. And those laws were simply waiting for Roe to go away. So when it did in June, um, those laws immediately came back into effect. In a number of states, they have been challenged. Uh, and uh, in most cases, those challenges have been overruled and the laws have been allowed to, to take effect. Um, there may be a state or two where that there, it's still kind of hanging in the balance. But Minnesota is not one of the states that had a trigger law. We had something far worse than that. Uh, we had a 1995 Minnesota State Supreme Court ruling called the Doe v. Gomez ruling in which our state Supreme Court, the Minnesota Supreme Court, handed down a decision recognizing, really inventing a right, a, a woman's right to an abortion in our state constitution. And in, fa in, in, way, in some ways, the right that they recognized in, in our state constitution went beyond the rights that, uh, that the Roe v. Wade decision had recognized nationally in the U.S. Constitution. So when Roe went, went away, that Dovi Gomez decision was still there and, uh, and still making abortion legal in Minnesota with almost no limitations right up through the moment of birth. Uh, and on top of that, um, establishing a right to taxpayer funding of abortions. So we are paying through our taxes for about 4,000 abortions a year and have been for um, well, since 1995. Uh, the number has gone up and down, but it's, it's, it's um, about uh, 4,000 a year that we're paying for. And the situation got worse the next month in July. Um, because up to that point, we had a number of state statutes that that regulated abortion in various ways in, in um, what we believe were very common sense regulations. Things like requiring parental notification for a minor um, child to have an abortion. Um, requiring a 24-hour waiting period before getting an abortion to give a woman time to rethink her decision. Um, uh, requ requiring a, a licensed physician to perform an abortion, and a number of other similar um, regulations that, that regulated or in some ways limited um, uh, abortion in our state. But a Ramsey County judge in June ruled that those were all unconstitutional and threw them out. So we now live in a state that has absolutely no limits or regulation on abortion from the moment of conception to the moment of birth. And, uh, and we think that's wrong. We think that's wrong. And so what do we do about that? There's a lot we can do about it. And, uh, and, I, well, and here are several things, several practical things that we can do. I, was, I rejoiced to uh, see uh, the message from Joe's office earlier this week um, about what you have been covering in, um, here at BCS regarding ways that believers and churches can, can be engaged with respect to the, the sanctity of life. Uh, uh, and I rejoice to see those things, and I heartily affirm that, especially the part about uh, pro-life crisis pregnancy centers. That is a key way. In fact, this is right in the church's sweet spot. And the reason it is because God has called the church to show the love of Christ. Government is not good at loving people. It's not, it was not instituted by God to love people. That's what the church is for, and that's what the church can do with, with a, um, a, a crucially valuable and essential uh, impact through supporting pro-life crisis pregnancy centers because there are 
more and more women who are facing crisis pregnancies and it may be tempted to look at abortion as their only option, maybe because they don't know there are other options or because they're getting pressured in that direction. But pro-life pro -life crisis pregnancy centers provide an alternative to abortion and uh, the, the church can play a key role in supporting them. In addition to that, there are opportunities for law and policy. Even despite the, the um, district court decision that was handed down in July that overthrew all of, overturned, I mean, all of our uh, um, existing state regulations. There are things that we can still do. For example, uh, we have a state law that's called a positive alternatives law that provides a, it's got a small pot of public funding that is, uh, is made available uh, for grants to organizations that provide alternatives to abortion. Things like crisis pregnancy centers and adoption and, uh, and, and so on, that, uh, the request for that funding, that, by the way, that statute was not overturned by the decision in July, it's still there. The request for funding from that program every year um, exceeds the funding available by at least double. So one of the things that we could do is um, to simply increase the funding available, the public funding available for that specific program. But there are other ways that law and policy can encourage alternatives to abortion instead of suppressing them like we have recently seen from our current um, Minnesota Attorney General who issued a consumer fraud alert regarding crisis pregnancy centers because they don't provide abortion counseling. So there are things that we can do with law and policy and even impact through elections, which is the next item. We can, as I mentioned earlier, we can support men and women for elected office who are like-minded in these principles and who will pass laws that, um, uh, that will initially um, provide reasonable regulations to abortion but avoid the, um, the prohibition, the, the unconstitutional ruling that was handed down in July. But more importantly, we can overturn Dovi Gomez, which was the basis for that July ruling that all of these laws limiting or regulating abortion were unconstitutional. We can overturn Dovi Gomez in, uh, um, there are three ways that that could be accomplished, and I want to suggest to you that one of those is the one that makes the most sense to pursue. One way that we could do that um, is to elect a pro-life governor and continue to elect pro-life governors so that over time, through judicial appointments, one of your questions was, how does the Supreme Court work? Well, this kind of gets at that. Through judicial appointments, appoint judges who will um, uh, uh, will take an, a, a, um, an originalist approach to the Constitution that, that will address, will rule based on the plain meaning of the words of the Constitution, not regarded as a living document that they can reinterpret at will, which, like was done with uh, Dovi Gomez, and rebuild our bench, like is what has happened at, with our federal Supreme Court at the national level. We could do the same thing here, but for that to happen, we would have to have a pro-life governor in place long enough to rebuild our bench. Um, in Minnesota, in blue or sometimes purplish Minnesota, that seems like a, uh, uh, an unlikely route and a very long-term route during which thousands of children are going to lose their lives to abortion. Another way to do this would be um, and this is a follow-up on your question about how the Supreme Court works. Um, normally, a governor appoints a, a, a Supreme Court judge to fill a vacancy on the Supreme Court, but then the judges serve a six-year term, and they stand for a, a retention election uh, every six years thereafter. Uh, and um, it, it's possible to replace a judge uh, by backing a challenger in a retention election. So we could replace 
the uh, liberal judges uh, currently on our court in, uh, in retention elections with, um, uh, with a conservative originalist uh, judicial um, candidate for, for that seat. Well, let me tell you that um, judges almost always run for re-election unopposed. It is rare to have, for a judge to be opposed for their office. I don't think we have any judges who are opposed on the ballot in this election. I could be wrong, there might be one, uh, but I don't think there are any that are running opposed. They're all running unopposed, including Judge Gilligan from Ramsey County, who handed down the decision in July that overturned all of our regulations on abortion. Um, I want to suggest that if you live in Ramsey County and Judge Gilligan shows up on your ballot, write somebody's name in instead of voting for or even leaving it blank. Write somebody's name in, send a message. Um, I could suggest the name Renee Carlson, who is general counsel for True North Legal, our legal arm. Uh, in fact, I'm thinking about doing that myself. But that also is a long route, and it would be, uh, that is to overturn judges through elections. It would, it would take multiple election cycles, and it, and it would be very costly and be very intense. It is rare for there to be a successful, contested um, judicial seat. The third way and the way that Minnesota Family Council is committed to over the next few years is by getting a, an amendment to our state constitution approved by the legislature and on the ballot for the voters of Minnesota to approve that would essentially take abortion out of the hands of the court. That would say something like this. This constitution does not recognize a right to abortion in Minnesota nor to taxpayer funding of abortion. That's all it would have to say. If that, if, if that constitutional amendment or one like that was passed, it would immediately overturn the Dovi Gomez decision and it would allow then uh, the people through their elected representatives to decide what our policy should be in this state regarding abortion. That's good. So. No, that was a lot right there, okay? So you can, you can hear, but you, a couple things I want you to just pick up there, right? One is you ought to pay attention to Supreme Court elections in Minnesota. If you're a Minnesota resident, here that actually matters. Then they do come up for election from time to time. And so that would be one place for you to focus, which we don't elect, you know, federal Supreme Court judges. Those are appointed by the president. Um, but the bigger thing I wanted you to hear and kind of what John just described there is in the kind of calling that God has given him and those that work with him and others um, the level of thought and intentionality to how to pursue what is good, right? We're talking about, you know, the glory of God and the common good. It's not just, well, we want, we want good things to happen, but it actually takes deliberate planning and thinking, is this the best route? Is that the best route? Is that the best route? Okay, well, if we go down that route, what's going to happen? Do we have enough people in place? In order, is there a deep enough bench of judges in Minnesota in order to work their way up to be appointed to the Supreme Court by a pro-life governor. Oh, it's gonna take a while. We should do that. We should, we should work that way, sure. Well, could we you know, remove one through a retention election every six years? Well, we'd have to have a really compelling candidate and make that a big issue and maybe we could get one there. So we, could, we can try that long way. But instead we say, well, maybe the shortest route is, are there enough pro-life people in Minnesota that would say, you know what, we wanna be able to vote on this. And so let's, let's run down that. But all of those sort of things are about Prudence, the, 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 per, the pursu sorry, prudent pursuit of justice in society. What's wise? I want, I want what's good and wise and, and just. What's the wise way to get there? What's the best means? That takes a lot of effort. It takes a lot of thought. It takes a lot of energy. It takes money. It takes all sorts of things. And so as we talk about the political side, there may be some of you who feel a kind of calling in that direction. Like, well, I'd love to think about that. I'd love to work towards that. And, and so maybe this is a, a question just to kind of broaden it out from the, from the life issue. Um, because when I think about the life issue, uh, you know, William Wilberforce is one of our heroes because of his work on the slave trade as a conscientious Christian. Felt the injustice of it. And I was just reading the other day, and uh, it's actually in Piper's book, Pleasures of God, because of the conference, right? And Pastor John just notes that it was 
20 plus year effort on just his part. That wasn't the whole movement, but it was like 20 plus years devoted to that kind of strategic thinking and creative thinking, because it wasn't just, let's ban it. It was, we gotta actually kind of maneuver this way to get this people involved, and we gotta go this way to get that people involved. 20 years of prayerful, dedicated effort before they got to the moment where they could ban the slave trade. And then, you know, rejoice in the snow and go, what, what does God want us to do next, okay? So it's gonna, there is that kind of dedicated effort. But we often think immediately about run for office. What are some of the other kind of, when you think about pursuing the common good in the public square, what are some of the other types of vocations that you see? Maybe you, inter, you, know, you got your kind of roles in nonprofit world, but what are some of the folks that like maybe you interface with on a, on a regular basis as a part? You, you go to the state capitol, but what are some of the other roles that you see that are really significant and that maybe, maybe some students might think, hey, I could, I could maybe lean into that? Yeah, um, first, I mean, there's so many different uh, ways uh, to um, pursue justice and, uh, you know, pursue, like, how do we advance uh, Christ's kingdom and, and um, love uh, the least of these. And, uh, I mean, in, in government, there's so many uh, different uh, types of positions. I mean, there's people that went to law school and they, you know, are, use that to, to um, work in the government. There's um, all sorts of uh, different avenues. Um, one thing I wanted to bring up, if you think of uh, other positions, um, but I just wanted to think of just even the um, the idea of of like we are you know part of being an image bearer of God is we reflect um, who God is uh, to our you know surrounding uh, circumstances to our world. Uh, we reflect Christ's love. We reflect uh, the glory of God, and and it's amazing that um, we can do that in any position. You know what I mean? You can be a custodian at the Capitol and reflect the glory of God. You could be, uh, you know, a teacher in a public school and reflect the glory of God. I worked in public schools for um, quite a few years, and, and it's, there's so many opportunities in so many different ways. And so I think just having that kind of broader category of, of how do I reflect uh, uh, God's glory um, in the image of, of Jesus Christ um, through any position that, that God is calling me in. Um, and... And the, the amazing thing is, like, the impact we're going to have, it's not up to us, right? We're, we're called to sow seed. We're called to, to um, till the ground. And we can rest in the fact that God is the one who provides the growth. And so no matter what we're doing, um, we, we literally, we, we uh, glory in our weakness. You know what I mean? We, we, Christ is, uh, his grace is sufficient. You know, his power is made perfect in our weakness. And so even in, in roles, sometimes it, it could be for Christians, I think they've seen politics, um, you know, done in, in worldly ways and in, in the wrong ways. And so we can kind of shy away from that. Um, but instead, it's like, no, Christians should go in and we should show the world a different way. You know, we, we go into politics. Politics, we go into all these different roles, whether it's going to law school or, or any, any avenue like that. Um, and, and we do it in a Christ-honoring way. We do it in a way where we're, uh, we're willing to sacrifice ourselves because we're not just trying to, to, to win an argument, but we're actually uh, trying to follow our Savior who was willing to, to die on a cross. And so that's just... I'm, yeah, we're I'm not just trying to win arguments. We're trying to win people. Amen. Amen. So I'm, I could keep going, but I'll yep. let you talk. <laughs> it's citizenship worthy of the gospel of Christ and for the sake of the gospel. It, it's When we talk about political engagement, Christian political engagement, we're not talking about an add-on to the gospel. We're not talking about a distraction from the gospel. It, it's about the gospel. It's for the gospel. It's what Paul wrote to the Philippians, citizenship worthy of the gospel. And the passage that Joshua mentioned earlier um, when he, uh, from uh, 1 Timothy 2, verses 1 and 2, praying for uh, rulers and all who are in authority, that we may lead peaceful and tranquil lives with all godliness and dignity. Why? Because this is good and pleases God, our Savior, who desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. The Apostle Paul there established the connection between the impact we have on those who lead us First of all, through prayer, for sure, but also by extension through all the other means that in 21st century America, he has, he has 
presented to us, he, he has given us as ways to influence our government, those who are in authority. He is, the apostle establishes a connection between that influence and people being saved and coming to the knowledge of the truth. So if you want people to get saved, pray for your leaders and engage with them. Encourage them to do the right thing. By the way, that's lobbying. <laughs> you can be a lobbyist for good. Encourage them to do the right thing. Remonstrate with them when they don't do the right thing in a respectful and, and kind way that is worthy of the gospel of Christ, but is nevertheless truthful, uncompromisingly truthful. One way to... Um think about the, the broader picture of the vocational possibilities. I remember when we went to the, to the Capitol and we're going through and we're trying to meet with the elected representatives, mm -hmm. but all of them have some kind of administrative assistant mm -hmm. or a secretary or, or somebody like that who kind of is manning their desk right out in front. Mm -hmm. And it's like, and, and there was a couple of them who actually um, had, you know, were particular churches. And, uh, and so there's that kind of role, which we don't think that person didn't get elected, mm -hmm. but that person is serving yep. that kind of common good yep. and frequently, legislative yeah, legislative assistance. So mm -hmm. frequently in those kind of roles, you've got the person who gets elected, but a lot of times, how do they decide how to vote? They've got groups of people who are teeing things up, who are doing research, right? So I think about the kind of skills that we cultivate here at Bethlehem, the ability to do research on particular topics, on education or on the family or on um, crime or whatever the sorts of issues are, and to dig deep into those and to try to help foster solutions and tee things up for the folks who actually propose things on the floor of uh, the legislature or in the city council or, or places like that. So there's other roles School that you boards. could kind of think about beyond just, oh, I'm not the sort of person who's going to run for office. It's like, that's okay. There might be other vocations where you could pursue good uh, in, and do, um, uh, do the work of God in the public square in those kind of ways. Even in, um, in the administrative branch, as a dreaded bureaucrat, <laughs> right. um, Nebuchadnezzar had a Daniel. Yeah. Artaxerxes had a Nehemiah. We need Daniels and Nehemiahs today who will, will bring training, uh, intellectual rigor, capability, and grounding in God's word and in faith in Christ to bear in the, the administration of government, whether it's at the city, the local level, or a school district, the, the, a county, the state, the federal government, at, at all of those levels, we need Daniels and Nehemiahs who will serve God for good and for the good of all the people in those offices, often unrecognized, unnoticed, but potentially having dramatic effect, dramatic impact. Um, maybe here's a question. One of the reasons I think that sometimes we shy away from the political is because of how frequently politicians can let you down. You mm -hmm. think some guy campaigns on something and, uh, and says, I'm gonna do this, and then he gets into office and he, he doesn't do it. And so you think, well, what are, why would we even bother with this? How, what would you say to someone who, feel, who feels that way, who feels like, you know what, the politicians are just gonna make big promises and then let you down, so kind of why, why bother? What, what would be the kind of counsel to encourage those who would be, just wanna write the whole thing off? Well, I mean, if you, First of all, if you live in the world, you got a, a boss out there. I mean, they're going to make promises that you don't make, but you can't just quit your job. You know what I'm saying? So part of it is just like, man, that's the world. Like, people are broken and sinful, and, and people, especially when it comes to, poli like, politics, I mean, it's like people are just shady. They're going to say anything to get your vote, right? And so we got to be, I think, it's uh, um, innocent as uh, doves, but... Um, as uh, wise as uh, serpents, but it's, I think it's, it's kind of being realistic about um, we're not putting our hope in politics, we're not putting our hope into a person, um, and knowing like people are going to 
let us down. People are going to uh, manipulate. There's going to be people that might say the right things, but um, whose whose hearts are far, you know, from the truth. Um, and so it's, I think as Christians, it's it's just kind of thinking of it in a just a sobering, realistic way, realizing like we're not um, unaware of the schemes of the devil. You know, the, Satan can present himself as an angel of light. Um, and so don't be discouraged when people, uh, you know, say something but then are deceptive. You know, they, they thought, you know, you thought you were, they were going to do something um, and they don't end up doing it because it's, man, this, the, we know the human heart, especially as, you know, reformed uh, Christians. And one thing I just want to add, like, uh, uh, I think in, in our uh, type of government where um, that, the type of access we have, uh, you, you tell Paul, the apostle Paul, like, yeah, in our form of government, you can call up your legislator, you could call up your representative and set up a meeting. I think Paul would be like, yo, what are y'all, what are y'all doing? Like, yo, I'm over here, you know, getting arrested to try to talk to the, the, you know, the ruling authority. I'm appealing to stay arrested and, you know, going up the chain just to be a witness to the gospel. And man, you guys could just, you know, send an email out <laughs> and have a, you know, set up a meeting or, or, um, you know, nowadays, uh, People, uh, a lot of representatives or council members, they'll just do like public events, like community uh, office hours where they're just trying to meet people. And I would encourage you, like a lot of times Christians, we focus so much on national politics, which we should, but half the time we don't even know who our local representative is. And most of the time, they, the decisions they make um, affect us in uh, a lot more uh, consequential ways. And so know your local representatives, build relationships, um, be salt and light, and, um, and yeah, just uh, be aware. Be aware of who, who of the local level of uh, uh, um, government. So I completely didn't answer your question. No, no, <laughs> no amen, amen to all of that. Because part of what we need to do in a situation like that is continue to encourage those politicians that that um, that seem to be wavering or mm. even that let us down. Um, don't write them off. Go back to them respectfully and speak the truth to them. If 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 they have gotten gone off the rails, call them back on the rails. Encourage them. And it helps to have a big database. <laughs> a big database. So you can generate a lot of phone calls and emails to their office. Um, because, because, I mean, to, to be serious about that, politicians pay attention to their constituents. They, they'll tend to go along with who they hear the most from. And, and so they need to hear from us if, if, if we think they're, they've gone, gotten off track, they need to hear from us. Mm -hmm. And in a way that doesn't um, make enemies of them, not in an adversarial way, but in a respectful way, call them back. I think this is actually one of the really a difficult thing for a lot of uh, Christians because one of the modern temptations is that politics does become a kind of religion, right? Like people orient, like the the kinds of things that they are doing in relation to politics is a kind of religious devotion um, because maybe they don't have a eternal hope or anything like that. And we're, we're busy doing life and seeking to, you know, uh, raise our families and preach the gospel, be faithful in our studies or, or what have you. Um, well, what that means then is the folks who are most animated to affect their agenda are the ones who are in the ear all the time. Mm -hmm. And that can wear people down. And so, um, I don't know what I heard it, somebody said the other day that, you know, conservatism is boring, right? When you're trying to preserve ancient things and good things like the family or like life or sort of, it's like mustering up the energy. You don't have, you won't be able to match the energy necessarily of those who are, you know, bent on remaking society or human nature in their own way. But there is still a, a, a kind of defensive, um, we want to preserve what is good. We want to pursue what is just. And that requires action on our part. So I appreciate that kind of call to not, to not give up. I want to ask one more. We are almost out of time. So I want to ask one more question from each of you, or from each of you to speak to, is this. Um, what's one thing that as you're doing what you do that is really encouraging you right now? And what is one way that this group could pray for you guys in the work that you're doing? So what's one thing that you're just going, man, I see God's hand here, and then pray for us here. You both answer that. Okay. All right. Um, I think 
an encouraging thing is um, we're able to meet with both sides of the aisle um, as pastors and uh, sow God's word and um, and pray for uh, our um, representatives on both sides of the aisle. I, th I think that's really encouraging and it gives a, um, a, a prophetic picture of, of, you know, political parties are vehicles. You know, they're, they're not, they're, you can get in them, you can do, you know, you got to go somewhere, but at the, end of, at the end of the day as Christians, you know, we're not beholden to a party. And so to be able to uh, show that to politicians on both sides is, a, is has been an encouragement and I think it's been surprising for them to see as well. Um, and then someone to pray for is, uh, uh, I think, continued um, continued uh, open doors you know it's uh sometimes people hear pastor and you know there's all sorts of different stereotypes of, of what that is and so um sometimes we're not able to get meetings um and uh and so just continued open doors and uh continued uh just that the lord would go before us um and that we would um be able to just sow the word in in boldness and yet in compassion so I think the most encouraging thing for me in the last couple of years is to see how pastors and believers generally are responding to the vision for citizenship worthy of the gospel of Christ that we've talked about here this morning and that, that we've been lifting up for, for f four decades now. We're coming up on our 40th anniversary in January. And since the founding of, of the organization, um, uh, We've recognized that engaging pastors in churches is, is key to the success of this ministry because that's where the troops are. That, that's, that's where the Christian citizens are that we're, that we're seeking to inform and mobilize. Um, but we have been frustrated year after year after year, time and again. Pastors run away. Ah, that's too political. We don't want anything to do with that. My ministry, my calling is to the ministry of the gospel, and that's politics, and it... it, it that's not for us. That's not our calling. And we have not gotten anywhere except with a church here or there who's, who capture somehow a vision for being salt and light, as, as we always said, in the political arena. But when the reality of Philippians 1.27 kind of descended on us, where, where Paul wrote, and if you, if you look not at the English translation, but if you look at the language that he actually used, in writing to the Philippians who were Roman citizens and for whom earthly Roman citizenship was a really big deal, he called them to exercise their earthly citizenship in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. And as we've listed that, lifted that vision up and, and, and shared this with pastors through the work that Joshua does and the others that work with Church Ambassador Network and, and shared with them a vision for um, for. Uh, citizenship that is about the gospel and that is for the sake of the gospel it is resonating with them and now instead of running away they're running to it and that is encouraging hugely encouraging to me let me pray for us as we head to head to lunch here lord um lord we do know that these uh this earthly citizenship does matter it matters to you because you've planted us here in the world but not of the world and so we want to bring a different kind of air uh we want to um, bring a different kind of influence, um, attacking strongholds with arguments uh, and um, seeking to persuade. And we need your help for it to be effective at all. And so I, I pray that uh, you would bless these brothers as they do their labor of encouragement and shepherding of elected officials, seeking to um, bring them before you uh, and to have them deal with the reality that, that Jesus reigns and cares for them. And so I pray that you would bless and open those doors for effective ministry. May the word run and be honored throughout the city councils and, and state legislatures of this state. And then I pray, Lord, that you would give us uh, a vision for whatever role we have in, in, uh, in exercising our citizenship. Even if it's as simple as voting, um, would you help us to steward it well as a trust from you for the sake of your great name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. This presentation was made possible by the generous contributors to the Serious Joy Scholarship, permitting our graduates to launch into life and ministry without a burden of student loan debt.